Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the April uh, webinar for CMC certification. Uh, this is Andrew Geens doing the introduction as normal. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping, just remind everyone if it's the first one you've been to, uh, we will record this and make it available uh, through the news page on our website tomorrow. And we'll also have a, uh, a copy of the slides if you like to look through them at your leisure. Um, after the event. So that's the main housekeeping items. Um, if I could ask you to um, use the question function uh, in GoTo, if you have any questions for the speaker, we'll deal with questions at the end, but type them in as they occur to you using the questions function. Um, and just a bit of a heads up for next month, we're hoping to have something for uh, EPC assessors next month. Uh, okay, so we're lucky today to have uh, Martin Kenzie with us. Martin is the UK sales manager for 2G, and he's going to talk to us about using hydrogen as a fuel for CHP. So I'll hand over to Martin with no further ado, and uh, let's hear what he's got to say. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So this is our presentation that we run on the CHP technology that we've developed um, specifically around the 100% hydrogen uh, gas that we've been running as a fuel um, for about nine years now. So if, if you have any questions, once again, I said you can just ask them and I'll answer as best as I can. Why is my slide? <laughs> my slide. Yeah. <laughs> So um, we're, a, we're a, sort of the company that a lot of people have never even heard of. Um, so we're a German company. We're based in the northern part uh, of Germany. We're actually close uh, to the Dutch border. Uh, so obviously our headquarters and manufacturing centre is in Heek uh, in Germany. Um, we actually design and build uh, engines ourselves um, for the CHP uh, industry. We're the third largest uh, engine manufacturing CHP producer uh, in the whole of Europe. Um, we're generally producing engines um, from 50 kilowatts, our own engines, up to one megawatt um, on natural gas and hydrogen. And then obviously we also have packaging development agreements with MTU and the Ambacker and the likes, uh, where we need to use, obviously use larger uh, power engines itself. Um, we're 650 employees, uh, but out of that, 42 uh, members of us are actually part of the research and development team. So an awful lot of the time and effort of the companies it is about designing and developing engines. So we have six and a half, uh, nearly 7,000 actually, of these engines running um, in basically every corner of the world. Um, and we've got nine international subsidiaries. So we're pretty much all over the world. Um, it's just that a lot of people might never even heard of us and, and actually know what we do for a living. So the power to gas sector um, is quite developing now. Um, especially in the last couple of years. So originally, uh, back in 2006, 2007, uh, the German government were uh, thinking about what scenarios they could develop, uh, either backing the battery economy or trying to back the hydrogen economy. And at that point, they decided they didn't really like where the metal was coming from, um, it's obviously all the batteries and everything else. So the German government decided wholeheartedly they were going to back the hydrogen economy. So an awful lot of work was put in for the development about how to produce hydrogen uh, from electrolysis. So there was an awful lot of excess wind energy uh, in Germany and specifically throughout the whole of Europe and the UK. So at night, an awful lot of that wind energy was either being uh, curtailed with the wind turbines being turned out of the wind. Some of it was going into battery storage, um, but a lot of it then was been obviously being converted through electrolysis, uh, splitting of high of water into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, and obviously the hydrogen was being stored for obviously for use later on. There was a lot of development work about the injection of hydrogen back onto the German gas grid. Um, initially as well, there was some work done about the methane methanization of hydrogen, uh, obviously putting the carbon back into it to make an official, artificial form of methane uh, to run in the engines. But at that point in time, it was decided this, Rather than obviously using methanization, it was just better to actually just use the hydrogen directly uh, into an engine. So we started developing the hydrogen engines. Um, initially, it wasn't really that much uh, of a great um, 
step forward for us in a certain way. We'd already developed a lot of uh, biomethane and uh, Syngas engines, and Syngas awful had um, 40 man, 40 percent of hydrogen in it. So we'd already developed the technology for running obviously high percentages of hydrogen into engines. And, and for us, I said biogas, syngas, hydrogen, I said they're all just gases. So it's just a case of how we set the engine up and obviously how we play around uh, with that engine. So how we do it. So normally in a conventional engine, a conventional reciprocating engine, uh, the gas air fuel mixer goes through a turbocharger, obviously before it obviously goes into the engine. And specifically, that, that's how obviously you get the power outputs, um, obviously of high efficiency engines. When we're running hydrogen, uh, especially above 40%, uh, below 40%, there's no problem at all, still running it through the turbocharger and injecting it in the standard way. And we just obviously put a gas mixer in with the hydrogen blend with the natural gas uh, in the same conventional way. What we found is when we start moving above 40% of hydrogen blends, because of the combustible nature of hydrogen, because obviously it's quite uh, a low detonation point, um, you, have, you run the risk that you can blow up the turbocharger if you start moving at higher than 40% blends going through a turbocharger. So all we actually do is um, we bypass the turbocharger to run with hydrogen, 100% hydrogen or 40% and above. So all this means is we just bypass the turbocharger, we put direct uh, hydrogen injection cylinder or hydrogen injection directly above the cylinder heads. So the air mixture still goes through the turbocharger and then obviously just before it goes into the cylinder head, we mix obviously the hydrogen at that point into the engine. So this is what we do with all the engine technologies uh, above when we're running hydrogen above 40% blends. So below 40%, there's no problem at all, running through the conventional mixer. Above 40%, so we bypass the turbocharger and we obviously do the hydrogen injection directly into the cylinder head. It, it's not really that complicated about how you obviously converse uh, an engine into running obviously 100% hydrogen from a natural gas uh, base. So once again, because we did an awful lot of this work with the development of uh, uh, various blends of hydrogen. We still have conventional gas mixer obviously on the engine as well. So it's one of those cases where you can run 100% hydrogen into the engines if you've got it, or if you've still got the requirements to run the engines uh, and you obviously haven't got the hydrogen available, you can then run obviously natural gas or biogas or anything else through the engine in the same way. It's the same engine, it's obviously just runs a different way depending on obviously what gas mixtures and everything else you've got it. This gives great capabilities in some of the applications that we've run. Um, obviously, we have hydrogen being generated at night. So while we can run on pure hydrogen, we run pure hydrogen. But if the hydrogen has been depleted and the, the leisure centers still need, obviously, heat for the, the, the swing pills, etc., we can obviously just um, put natural gas uh, back into the engine. And once again, we have the technology. This all happens. Uh, completely automatically. So the switching in between different gases and everything else, it's not like you've got to be going there with a screwdriver uh, to make the adjustments and everything else. It just all happens seamlessly. So it just gives you a greater flexibility on the engines that you can actually run with either types of engine, either types of gases, 100% hydrogen or blends of hydrogen or back down to the 100% uh, natural gas or biogases, syngases, uh, etc. So once again, because this isn't a new design engine. This is our, our existing natural gas engines just made to run with hydrogen. We can make the adaption uh, to obviously run uh, on hydrogen anytime people want it. As I said, the normal engines that we sell will run with 40% hydrogen without doing anything to it because we don't have to bypass the turbocharger. But if people say, okay, we're now at a point where we want to run the engine, we want to run it on 40, 50, 60, 100% hydrogen, we can come back to size at any time and just fit the hydrogen injection system above the cylinder heads at any point in time. So it's not like you're having to buy an engine now that will only run on natural gas or an engine that will only run on hydrogen. It's exactly the same engine, just obviously with a bit more technology put on top of it. So it's not like you can buy something that's going to end up being a stranded asset if hydrogen comes along and your natural gas engine can't run with it. So a lot of the applications, it's you can buy the engine now and obviously run it on natural gas. Then as soon as obviously hydrogen comes along, up to 40%, you don't have to worry about it. It'll do anything. And as soon as you go over 40% hydrogen, put the injection system on it, and obviously then you can run on 100% hydrogen with exactly the same engine block uh, without changing the infrastructure or anything else. So one of the 
big advantages also um, with hydrogen because it's got quite um, it's quite combustible which is the reason why we bypass the turbocharger it means we can play around obviously the lambda number so the lambda is the ratio between the air fuel mixture going into the engine so obviously a lot of uh, conventional gases natural gas biogas everything else there's a certain limit that you can put or uh, air going into it obviously before you can still combust and effectively get the gas to detonate inside the cylinder head. Uh, with hydrogen, because it's quite combustible, we can obviously operate at higher lambda values. Um, one of the big advantages of this is the higher the lambda value, the more oxygen obviously you're putting through the engine to, to get it detonating. It lowers down uh, the nitrous oxide emissions from the engine. So it's very easy for us to play around uh, within this operational window to achieve whatever uh, NOx limits are susceptible or required for the engine going out. I mean, when we did the original first engines that we put in as trial basis, we were running the engines at 500 NOx, because obviously that was quite acceptable at the time, uh, based on the fact that the technology or the, uh, the, the emissions was based on the biogas world. But we've got the engines now running down to 95 uh, milligram NOx. Exactly the same engine, a slight little change on the power output to the engine. But it's because a lot of the applications now, uh, people are wanting these engines to go inside city centres, especially obviously running with hydrogen uh, because of corporate headquarters, etc. So it's easy, once again, whatever is required um, for the application, we can play around just with obviously the engine tuning uh, and the lambda value to make it achieve achievable. So once again, th this isn't just uh, a single engine that we've got ours um, as a trial test of engine or anything else. We have our, our entire range uh, of engines from our Agenda uh, range of engines. So everything from our four cylinder all the way up to our 20 cylinder. These are natural gas derivative engines, but obviously we can have uh, them actually all run on 100% hydrogen. We do have them running on. So once again, it's not a case that we've designed something and we've got one engine and we're trying to make it fit every single application. Anything from 115 kilowatts all the way up to 750 kilowatts, this, these are pure hydrogen outputs. So once again, it, it fits the applications having our range of engines. But even our smaller or our, our different range of engines called the, the Aura range, um, we can make them run 100% hydrogen as well. Effectively, any engines that we manufacture, we can make run on 100% hydrogen with exactly the same uh, bypass technology in the hydrogen injection systems. So once again, it's, it's a case that the engines are available to fit all the different applications and different engine sizes and everything else um, in, from our standard markets that we obviously deal with. So once again, we've got these um, examples of engines everywhere. So we've, so we've been doing this since 2008 um, when we did the first engine, which was in Berlin Airport. So that's why you can see obviously it's a 306. So this was originally our third, our third, our three series of engine before we obviously moved into our four series of engine now. So the very first engine we put in was a six cylinder engine of our three series. But then obviously since then, obviously we developed the engines further into our fourth series and obviously increased obviously the efficiencies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously now the entire range of our engines, four, six, all the way to 20 cylinders are available, either the standard natural gas or the standard natural gas with hydrogen um, and injection system on them. So we, we, we put these engines effectively all over the world. Um, so obviously we've got demonstrated uh, projects obviously in Germany. A lot of these are in Germany. In fact, the only one that isn't in Germany is the one we did in Dubai. Um, we've got projects that we've done in Japan and obviously the ones we've done in the UK as well. But I'll, I'll cover all of the case studies in a bit now. So this was the very first um, project that we did. So th this was the project that the German government did back in 2012 when they were trying to sort of um, determine whether the hydrogen economy would work. So it, it was based on the wind farm was going to be running uh, through the electrolyzer to produce hydrogen. It demonstrated hydrogen injection back onto the German gas grid. Uh, all of the uh, vehicles on the Berlin airport are obviously running hydrogen fuel cells. It demonstrated low pressure, low temperature uh, storage of hydrogen. And obviously we put the engines on it to demonstrate, obviously we can run engines on 100% hydrogen. So once again, it's these are real problems. So if, apart from the COVID lockdown, people can get on planes and, and go and visit these things. These are existing uh, technologies. It's not something we've come up with a whiteboard and said, yeah, this is fine. It might work. Th these are actually things that have actually worked. So once again, this this is the actual um, the unit that's in Berlin Airport. And 
So you can actually see we've got the hydrogen injection system on it, but we've still got the conventional gas mixer on the engine as well. So once again, it's still got that facility that we can run 100% hydrogen when the hydrogen's available, or if the airport still needs the heat, et cetera, uh, from the CHP at certain points in time, we can still run the engine on 100% uh, natural gas as well. So this was uh, the project that we did. I mean, obviously, last year, if it wasn't for the COVID, there was going to be the Hydrogen Expo, uh, part of the World Expo that was going to happen in Dubai. So one of the, the things about the Hydrogen Expo, uh, it's connected to the world's largest PV um, farm, is connected to electrolyzer producing hydrogen. So the Expo, all of the vehicles and the buses and everything else that were going to be running people around the Expo uh, were all hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, we obviously put on uh, the engines uh, to demonstrate obviously running hydrogen through engines and producing obviously the heating and cooling from the, the CHPs. So it's the only project that we've done really that isn't connected to an electrolyzer that's connected to uh, a wind farm. Obviously they didn't need the wind farms obviously over in Dubai when they've got the largest PV farms. So once again the hydrogen is produced effectively in exactly the same way through electrolysis. It was just a different uh, electricity feed going into it, being obviously a PV rather than the wind farm. So this was the project that we did over in Hapsford um, down in Bavaria. Um, this is the one that we won actually a lot of the energy awards for and the CHP awards for last year and the year before. So Hapsford, the municipality in Germany, um, years ago, they had this ambition to become uh, completely green. So they started building their own wind farms um, to obviously yeah, electrify uh, the city or electrify the town. It got to the stage where they've actually ended up building 200% uh, of wind capability uh, for the town more than they actually need it. So obviously a lot of the times, especially at night, there's so much excess electricity available from this wind farm. The, 60, 70 percent of the wind turbines were sending out of the wind. So once again, they decided that this didn't seem to suit or sit well with them, and especially because we were running natural gas at CHPs uh, there already. So they put on a Siemens electrolyzer, uh, one and a half, one and a quarter meg electrolyzer, and the, during the night when they've got the obviously the down and they were originally going to suffer the downturn of electricity, they run the excess electricity now uh, into the electrolyzer and they produce hydrogen. Um, green piece by the hydrogen that's injected uh, onto the gas grid uh, from this. So, so green piece, we're co effectively calling it wind gas. So obviously it's only 5% blend uh, going back onto the national grid or the, the gas, German gas infrastructure that they're buying. But it, once again, it, it's, a, it's a commodity that people will be using to offset their carbon footprints, effectively buying a hydrogen injected gas onto the grid. Um, for us, once again, the hydrogen is stored in hydrogen storage tanks, and we've got 140 uh, kilowatt CHP. So they obviously generate hydrogen, which is stored during the night, and then during the day when they need obviously the electricity and the heat for the to swim pools and the schools, they run obviously run the hydrogen then back into the engine, and we obviously generate 100% renewable energy off it. But this is also one of the ones where the, the the engine's still got the capability of obviously running with natural gas. So once again, if we are at the point where sometimes during the winter, they still need heat coming off the CHP, but all the hydrogen's been depleted or all the hydrogen's been sold uh, to the gas grid, uh, we can actually run the engine on 100% natural gas, no problem at all. And it'll happily switch backwards and forwards in between itself, um, in between the two uh, different gases. This is one of the first district heating schemes that we did. So this is the district energy scheme in Esslingen, once again also in Germany. Uh, this was also really a sort of a demonstration project um, to demonstrate that you could actually run a district heating scheme with hydrogen. So once again, so we, we put in a small a couple of hundred kilowatts uh, CHP, which is obviously supplying the electricity, but it's also supplying the thermal energy for the district uh, network. So once again, it was just a demonstration project to prove that you could get a district heating energy system and effectively make it 100% green just by utilising hydrogen into the engine rather than a natural gas into the engine. Going forward, I think there's going to be a lot more interest in these district energy schemes with the switch out of engines or the switch out of uh, the gas running the engines uh, to actually make uh, the, the district schemes, especially a lot of the ones we've got in the UK, uh, go 100% green just by obviously changing the gas going into the engine. Um, Orkney Airport, this was the first project that we did in the UK. So this is actually 
probably going onto the ground in the last couple of weeks. Um, this is also a bit of a different project as well. This is the first one where the electrolysis equipment actually isn't in the vicinity of the CHP. So the Marine Energy Centre um, up in Orkney is where they do a lot of the tidal testing of tidal turbines. So there's an awful excess of electricity because the interconnect back into Scotland isn't uh, very good to be able to take all the electricity that's being produced by the tidal power. So all the, electro the electrolysis plants, I think, sit on E-Day, um, and the E-Day produces obviously all the hydrogen from the excess electricity that's being produced from the tidal farms. It's then being shipped in into Orkney in containerized hydrogen storage vessels. So obviously the, the hydrogen vessels are getting swapped in and out. So the, the containerized units are being brought in, and obviously one in, one out. So this is the first project that we've done worldwide where the actual hydrogen is actually being shipped in um, to the, uh, the location. There's an awful lot of interest in this as well, uh, especially for temporary power or um, manufacturing or building, um, things like Reading and Glastonbury, the festivals, where they obviously want to have some green energy being delivered. Well, containerized hydrogen being delivered uh, and obviously an engine that can run on it is a, is a good way. Obviously, you can actually generate green energy on site. Uh, without all the, without the hassle of actually trying to generate the hydrogen on site in the same way. So it all sounds great. <laughs> Why doesn't everybody just run hydrogen engines uh, at the moment for the, the, the green position in a certain way? Um, and the problem at the moment is none of this is economic. Um, and we're not going to sort of like blow smoke up people. Um, it doesn't make sense economically at the moment. All of the projects we've been doing have been done. They're either funded um, from a different way, grant funded by governments or municipalities. Uh, none of it makes sense at the moment. Uh, and the reason being is hydrogen, even from an electrolyzer, uh, but connected to a wind farm, is generally costing about 12, 12 and a half P, where you can buy natural gas at 1.6 P. Um, but obviously the economics of this is going to be changing when subsidies come into it. So it's the same way this like wind um, energy from waste plants, PV, no renewable technology uh, when it's in its infancy uh, is cost effective. So everything basically has to be grant funded or funded by a different way or backed up with subsidies to make it economic to start and kickstart the economy uh, to get the gears sort of like spinning. Um, so at the moment we, we did an awful lot uh, analysis looking at which way it was going to be done and I think even Bayes at the moment I think they, they might do it through CFDs I think that's the most common um, uh, opinion that people have at the moment about the hydrogen economy or the hydrogen subsidies coming in uh, the Dutch government are doing theirs based on the CO2 abatement that's coming off uh, the hydrogen produced from electrolysis plants uh, the Germans are sort of umming and ahhing about it, but everyone's in a certain way is just waiting to see what sort of um, funding or what sort of subsidy agreement is going to be put in place to make obviously hydrogen um, economic. I think it's the only way to start the economy, um, obviously, or to start the economic development of hydrogen going forward. Uh, but everyone at the moment is just uncertain about obviously which way it's going to be done. Um, but at some point it will come. Um, but it's like we tell everybody, and that, that's why you can buy a hydrogen engine now, but you won't be able to run it because obviously, unless you can obviously afford to obviously put the hydrogen into it, but you can just buy a natural gas engine now, uh, run it, you know, at some point over that 15, 20 years that it lives for, uh, adopt it then to obviously running on the hydrogen. So we do know at some point, I said with hydrogen economy with subsidies and everything else starts kicking into place obviously with the hydrogen uh, either being generated from blue or green hydrogen um, there's going to be a conversion point when the return on investment running on natural gas and then the switch over to running on hydrogen is going to be economic then to obviously switch over and convert the engine to run 100% hydrogen as the gas grid starts greening up anyway i mean hydrogen injection is going to start happening um, it's just not legal at the moment uh, until all the the safety protocols and everything gets changed but as soon as it starts uh, sort of like decarbonizing and more hydrogen comes into it um, as i said up until 40 percent you can run the hydrogen you can run the engines without doing anything to it um, it's just then obviously some of the key projects we work on people want to make sort of a, a method statement that we're running 100% green energy, we're running 100% green hydrogen. And then we can obviously make the engine or convert the engine to run 100% hydrogen at any point in time. 
or failing that, people can just buy the engine directly out of the factory already with the hydrogen injection system on it in the same way that we, that's what we did in the Orkney project. The engine was delivered on site, 100% hydrogen ready uh, from day one. So it was really a case of watching it and seeing, obviously, at what sort of point do you decide um, whether it's an economic uh, point or whether it's sort of like an environmental point, what you actually want to do with that engine and how you want to run it. But for, as I said, for most, it's, it's quite easy and it's just a case of watching it and playing around with it. Um, so this is one of the things that's quite interesting as well, because people think as the gas grid starts um, hygienizing and you get up to this, uh, the 20% the, uh, threshold that everyone thinks it's going to stay at for a couple of years. Um, they think obviously you're going to get 20% carbon reduction from putting 20% um, volume of hydrogen into the gas grid. It doesn't exactly work like that because obviously the calorific value of hydrogen is a lot less than natural gas. Putting 20% hydrogen into the natural gas grid only actually really gives you probably about 8, eight or 9% uh, CO2 reduction uh, just because obviously the carbon into uh, the the intensity, the energy intensity of the gases. But once again, it's still one of those things. It's still part of the, the journey or the part of the thinking about how you can get to carbon zero. So as you need the volume or the percentage of hydrogen blend in natural gas starts increasing, obviously the carbon reduction starts increasing. I mean, ideally, obviously you want to hit the 100%, but whether that's going to be 100% that's going to be in year one, two, seven, 10, 15, once again, it, it all depends on people's appetite for what they actually want to do with that engine. I said, if they allow the natural progression of the hydrogen injection into the gas grid to start creeping up to the 20%, fine, that'll give them a, roughly about an 8% carbon reduction on the run of the engine. Or if they want to make the statement or want to have the, um, the renewable credentials uh, for running 100% energy, then you move obviously to 100% volume of hydrogen going into the engine. But it's not a linear, um, that's a scale. It's one of the things that people need to understand about obviously hydrogen injection because people think, oh, well, the gas grid will have 20% hydrogen in it. That's 20% of our carbon target done. In reality, it isn't. So, in reality, um, hydrogen engines more than fuel cells, there's an awful lot of talk about fuel cells. Um, but one of the big advantages that an engine has uh, over a fuel cell, a fuel cell needs effectively 99.999% the five nines uh, pure hydrogen to actually run it we don't um, as i said it, for us these are just gas engines whether it's hydrogen or biogas or syngas or anything else so we don't need 100 percent pure medical grade hydrogen into the engine so we can take gas uh, impurities uh, into it and the engine will run no problem at all as i said it isn't an, an issue for us we can even use hydrogen it's a byproduct obviously of industrial processes uh, into the engines in the same way we did with syngas um, one of the big advantages also about a, an engine as opposed to a fuel cell, uh, we can run partial loadings into an engine, no problem at all. I mean, reciprocated engines are designed to run anything from 35% to 100% uh, load and anything in between. So we can modulate the engines up and down, day in, day out. You can't really do that with a fuel cell because it starts cracking down the cells. Uh, a fuel cell effectively really likes being switched on and left at 100% load all the time. Um, and for us, I said, it's, it's just a gas. It, it, it's nothing new for us. It's nothing new technology or anything else. Um, and because it's effectively the same core engine that we use and the same core controller and everything else, nothing really has changed apart from the gas. They, they still integrate into virtual power plants and do island moding uh, and everything else. And exactly can the same way we do with standard engines. Because for us, it is. It's a standard engine with a bit of hydrogen injection um, system on it. That's all it is. And once again, I said, the ability to run mixed gas streams um, through the same engine. I said, natural gas, on biogas, syngas, uh, any combination or any sort of blends in between. It's easy. It's doctable. Um, whatever you've got, effectively, we can run the engine on it. So that's it, really. I said, it's it's for us, it's, it's, it's nothing too groundbreaking. It's not rocket science. I said, it's effectively just a gas engine that all we do is we just change the gas input. Uh, into it and we just make it run um as i said using an injection system and bypassing the turbocharger that's effectively it so if anybody's got any questions okay thank you martin that was very interesting 
Um, we have got a few questions already, but uh, if anyone else has any questions, please get them uh, typed in. Uh, the first question, Martin, came in before you got to the Orkney slide, and the Orkney slide may have answered it partially, so maybe it's more about scale. So the question is, um, could you use this equipment for a portable generator setup, or does the infrastructure to supply the fuel uh, limit that as an application? Uh, Stranging, uh, no, because we're having an awful lot of conversations at the moment about temporary power. Um, so obviously, I mean, generally, I mean, a lot of the times, 90% of the application, the CHP is obviously integrated into a building, etc. Um, but we're actually we're having an awful lot of conversations at the moment about supplying the CHP containers that can be used in temporary power situations, whether it's building sites or whether it's music venues. Um, and once again, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of work being done in uh, some of the Scandinavian countries about producing, obviously, containerized hydrogen deliveries. So once again, we can deliver an engine to size, um, whether we're doing it or whether a temporary company are doing it. Uh, and then effectively, you have two containers. You have the container with the engine uh, inside it, and you have a container, obviously, with the hydrogen um, storage in it. And then once again, it, it's just connecting onto it in exactly the same way you could use a diesel generator, uh, except it's a natural gas generator. And depending on the applications, a lot of the science, we wouldn't even envisage running it as a CHP. We'd envisage just running it as a straightforward gas engine, a gas generator. We wouldn't even put the heat recovery heat exchanges on it. So, so yes, it, it, it's very viable. And there's, there's a lot of conversations we're having about, people, about that specific thing, specifically around building sites, uh, building, obviously, because people don't want diesels generators if they're building, obviously, um, low-cost housing or low-carbon uh, housing and also things like music venues etc so so we, yeah it, it's de it's definitely happening and those conversations are happening already okay that's great thanks to, to an extent does that help um progress the technology ahead of um piped uh hydrogen supply well once again i said so the the, the applications that we've been looking at for this uh, specifically are, are about so that they wouldn't need in temporary installations they wouldn't need effectively piping up because obviously there's there's no hydrogen infrastructure at the moment anyway so the, it would be a case of this and you, you end up with an, an engine being delivered and you have a hydrogen um, containerized storage solution being delivered and obviously the, the, the container with obviously the hydrogen storage would obviously have all the gas in it to drive the engine and then it's just a case of obviously how, how large or how much density of, of hydrogen you need inside that container or that storage vessel and how long do you want to run the generators for. Um, but yeah, yeah, it could be any sort of like piping up into a gas infrastructure or anything else. It's effectively like you have a diesel generator and you have a diesel fuel um, tank sat next to it. You would have a hydrogen engine and you would have a hydrogen fuel tank sat next to it. It's exactly the same thing. I, I wondered whether off-site, uh, sorry, off-grid applications that use LPG were a sort of close parallel to this as well. Uh, well absolutely. I mean, we, we, we run engines sometimes on um, LPG anyway. Uh, and once again, I said, it, it, it's all dependent, obviously, the size of the engine and obviously the size of the storage vessel. I mean, because obviously, I mean, if you wanted, say, a megawatt engine, you might be changing that container every two days uh, to obviously yeah. get it. Um, once again, you then start thinking about whether you would actually use something like liquefied um, hydrogen and then obviously having an evaporator to convert it back to a gas to run into an engine. Once again, there's an awful lot of conversations that are going on about that, about what storage me uh, medium is needed, depending on obviously the quantity of gas uh, and the release rate that's needed. Um, a lot of the times, I said, we're, we're specifically talking about uh, gas gases, uh, but we also know on the larger applications, we're also uh, talking to a lot of people who were, who were thinking about producing liquefied hydrogen. Yeah. Okay, a couple of quick answer questions. Um, somebody's asked what the units P kilowatt G on the hydrogen cost graph on page 18 was, what that unit is. Page 18. One pence per kilowatt of gas. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. It, it could, when we, I mean, I said these slides. Um, I did these probably about three years ago now. So when, when we were um, starting to think about this, and obviously starting to think about obviously um, where the sort of the financials or the economics of this SAS, 
So we, we've done some calculations based on obviously where it was at the moment and what we need to get a break-even position. That's why it says 19.49 at the bottom. So, so, so effectively, we didn't know three years ago if, if Bayes were thinking about doing it on rocks or something like that equivalent. Um, so we knew uh, generally we could get hydrogen for about 12 and a half p a kilowatt. So we thought, right, if we're trying to get to a break-even point of 15 or 20 years, we're going to need rock subsidies of about 19p, um, which once again, that that's nearly triple or four times uh, what rock payments normally are. And then we thought, okay, but what, what different prices of hydrogen do we need to be to be that break even and what sort of uh, subsidy is needed to hit that break even position? And that, that's why we, we got down to the stage where we needed about five, five and a half P uh, of hydrogen to be in a break even position of 15, 20 years. It's still not an economic uh, position. But it's that break-even position where you might be then saving still thousand tons of carbon, even though it's not an economic payback, but it's it's a net present value zero position. So it was just a lot of different calculations we ran about where we think the price of hydrogen has to be before you don't need any subsidies. And and I said because it, it isn't even the case where you have to get the hydrogen down to like the one and a half two p where natural gas is to make it work or to make it sort of break even. Um, you just generally have to be around that five, five and a half p, uh, without any subsidy at all to make it economic, and, and, we, and we see that coming as electrolyzers start getting built, and um, obviously the cost of those starts coming down, and because obviously uh, one of the big costs of obviously generating hydrogen is obviously apart from the electrolyzer is actually the cost of electricity, um, but there's some of the novel contracts now where people are looking at because. Um, if people have rock contracts on their wind farms, they want those wind farms spinning, especially at night. They don't want them spinning out the wind. So some of those are, uh, are able to offer effectively zero cost um, electricity contracts at night. So then all of a sudden you've got zero cost uh, electricity going into an electrolyzer producing hydrogen because obviously the wind farm company is getting their subsidies, obviously, by the rock payments. Um, mm. So once that changes the economics as well about how people are actually looking about the, the model of this, about where the cost of hydrogen production is going to be. Okay, thanks. Uh, another quick one. Uh, are you able to uh, quote a rough figure? What, what is the cost per kilowatt hour maybe for, for the uh, additional injectors to convert to hydrogen? Uh, it's about 15% of the engine. But okay. for us to for us to convert an engine with, uh, to 100% hydrogen, it's roughly 15%. Yeah, okay. Um, getting quite a list of questions now, so I'll keep moving. Um, someone's asking whether there's a, a, whether there's a safety concern because hydrogen is colourless. Not really. Um, once again, I said, I mean, millions of tonnes of hydrogen are being used all over the uh, the world already anyway uh, in industry and everything else but but no we haven't really had any concerns uh, about about the color of it or the lack of color in it yeah perhaps in a in a boiler rather than a an engine flame color which is useful for for gas engineer might not be the same with hydrogen um but yeah okay um also, someone's heard about a trial for a hydrogen grid pipeline in the north of England. Is that um, something you're aware of? Well, there's, there's lots of uh, projects going on. I mean, there's, there's the H100 in Leeds. There's all the projects up in Dundee. Uh, I mean, Dundee's fighting for itself to probably be the, the first hydrogen city uh, in the UK. Um, there's the Acorn project, I think it's up in Rangemouth. I mean, that, that one project, um, that, that, that's a, a big electrolyzer connected to the, obviously the Scottish wind farms. Um, if that comes online in three years' time, they reckon that, could, that can put all six or seven percent hydrogen into the entire gas grid just on one project. Uh, but that's why in places like Dundee and stuff, they're also looking at putting in 100 percent dedicated hydrogen pipelines. And they, they put out the calls for industry on who might want to connect to that pipeline. I mean, in Germany, where our, where our manufacturing site is, in the next year, 18 months, we, we're, we've got a 100% dedicated hydrogen pipeline uh, going uh, around the back of our factory. Yeah, good. Uh, okay, uh, I think you may have answered this, but someone's asked with a specific number, so I'll just um, put that number into the mix. It's about viability at smaller scale, uh, less than 500 kilowatts. 
Well, once again, it's a, we, our, our, the smaller engines we've got, I mean, the one in Orkney is only 115 kilowatt um, engine. Um, it, it's like everything else. Uh, I mean, generally, the, the scale of economics gets better and better and better as they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but once again, at the moment, electrolysis isn't, a certain, isn't, isn't that sort of issue. Um, it's the electrolyzer probably might cost more than the engine itself. But once again, the economics don't work at all in any sort of uh, scale. So that, that's why most of the projects we've done, people are thinking, well, if it's, if it's not going to work economically, what, why go for a megawatt engine when that's 10 times more non-economic than a 100 kilowatt engine? So, so that's where it is at the moment. That's why a lot of these are sort of effectively demonstration or trial projects uh, to, to prove um, the, the infrastructure and everything else. But obviously, as the electrolyzer uh, sort of like industry or the, I mean, everyone's just waiting as effectively for Bayes to make the announcements on what the subsidies <coughs> for hydrogen generation. And then as soon as that happens, I mean, most of the electrolyzer companies, I mean, they're building like gigawatt factories to try to produce electrolyzers. They, they're just waiting to see what's happening. Because it's like the thing at the moment, I mean, you can produce the hydrogen at the moment, but unless you've got a use for it, what you're going to do with it, you can't inject it into the gas grid at the moment in the same way you can biomethane. But all of those safety legislations and everything else are all getting changed in the background. So sometime later this year, early next year, you'll be allowed to inject hydrogen into the gas grid in the same way you can biomethane. And once again, that then kickstarts uh, that economy. But it's, it's it, the wind. It's, it's the thing because I said we we've just, we have too much wind. I mean, generally throughout the whole of Europe, about thirty percent of the wind farms have to turn out to the wind at night. So there's so much wasted uh, potential energy that you think, well, rather than waste it, convert it to hydrogen, make hydrogen. I mean, that's, that's how most of the projects that we work on um, work. Uh, all the ones in Germany, they just produce hydrogen at night. They've got they've got no other use of that. Uh, the electricity so rather than just having an idle wind farm not doing anything produce hydrogen yeah yeah makes sense okay uh, some more technical questions uh with a naturally aspirated engine can you run 100 percent hydrogen without modifications or changing the injection system uh yes <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a nice easy answer it was only gonna be yes yeah. or no yeah, yeah it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's only on our turbocharged engines where we, where we get the problem. I mean, our, our yeah. all, uh, range of engines uh, generally aren't turbocharged anyway. Um, it's, it's just obviously, once again, so we, we, we were concentrated on our generator range of engines to start out with because they're turbocharged. We've got a higher power output uh, of them because generally speaking, no, normally when you run 100% hydrogen, uh, you're getting about anything from a, about a 20% um, deracing of the engine. Because one of the issues with hydrogen, it's got no, um, uh, effectively, it's got no knock resistance. So you can't run the engines at the moment, obviously, in the same power output, because you start getting knocking on the engine. The R&D department are working on that, because at the, at the moment, we're injecting hydrogen probably about four bar uh, into the cylinder heads. Um, we reckon if we move up to maybe 20 bar, we can alleviate the knock uh, issue on the hydrogen. And then we're, we're effectively going to be running the engines, the same power output of hydrogen as natural gas. Yeah, yeah, good. So uh, next question, I think it's related. When you switch over from natural gas to hydrogen, what effect does that have on the output from the engine? Um, well, no, normally, I said, because if, if we've got the engine set up to be running 100% hydrogen, then we switch obviously to natural gas. I mean, it, it, it's what we call a blending um, line. It, it's something we developed for the, high, for the, um, the biogas industry. Uh, where sometimes the biogas uh, anaerobic digesters didn't have enough biogas, so they obviously they still wanted the heat obviously to run the, uh, the anaerobic digesters. So we, we always developed this technology to run natural gas uh, into biogas um, for the blending uh, to keep the engines running. If we've if we've set the engine up to run 100% hydrogen, we wouldn't go higher than the power output of the hydrogen. So once again, if we've got the like our one megawatt engine, if we if we've got the hydrogen injection system on it and it's configured to run at 750 kilowatts uh, that we run it on natural um, that we run on hydrogen, if we go on to natural gas, we'll still run it at 750 kilowatts. We don't, we won't bother putting the power output. Otherwise, it means we have to change the compression ratios and everything else in the engine. Yeah, I guess that question was driven by what you said earlier about the difference in calorific value. 
Yeah, no, well, as I said, it, it's it, that, that's why I said so. If, if, if even though we get a D race uh, running hydrogen um, specifically because I said we, we don't want to uh, get the knocking issues on the engine cause uh, the engine to sort of like shake itself to death. Uh, once once we've derated the engine, or once we we, we know we want to run that derated value on natural gas, we just have a, the injection of the natural gas uh, going up to that same value. We don't obviously overpower the engine again. Okay, I've got a question about the Dubai project. Uh, what mix was considered, and what was the life expectancy? Um, yeah, it was the efficiency between natural gas and, and hydrogen. The Dubai project, it, was a, it, it's a, it, it doesn't have anything to do with natural gas. We don't even have a gas mixer on it. It's a 100% hydrogen dedicated engine. Um, the reason being is because it was part of the Hydrogen Expo, uh, they wanted to demonstrate that the you could produce, obviously, the, the Middle East um, wants to get into the hydrogen economy because to produce hydrogen, obviously, all you need is wind, sun, and water. Well, they've got an awful lot of sun. Got an awful lot of deserts, and they can get water. So they can they can see that they want to move their economy from a basically petrochemical or petrol industry into a hydrogen economy. So it was really a demonstration project that you could produce obviously hydrogen using your sunshine and water. Uh, so that that's why you know, the hydrogen expo was there to demonstrate you can use hydrogen in engines, you can use it in fuel cells, the buses, etc., etc., etc. That's all it was. So it was just a demonstration project. I mean, obviously, they they they, they weren't leasing too much about obviously the economics of it because they're not exactly sure of money. Um, but I said it, it was it was never intended uh, to run anything but 100% hydrogen into that engine. The efficiencies are basically the same. Whether you're running hydrogen or, well, or whether you're running natural gas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Um, another question about the, uh, the the portable situation. I think uh, someone's asking about the um, cost benefit uh, analysis on using using this to fuel emergency standby generators rather than 35 second gas oil. Would there be a, a size at which that would become uh, well, once again, it, 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 but this, this is something else at the NHS, and a, a lot of looking at this at the moment now. The, the NHS is quite funny actually, because up until I mean, 20 years ago, when I've, I've done this an awful long time, 20 years ago, like CHPs were the greatest thing ever for, for doing the NHS carbon targets, and so that, that's why we sub massive CHPs into, into all the NHS. And then obviously, the last couple of years, people have been arguing, saying, Oh, yes, yeah, so you can't use CHPs anymore because obviously the carbon position. And so the environmental people were the biggest uh, prohibitors for CHPs in hospitals until they worked out that they, they got this 2040 carbon zero target and they had no idea how to do it. So we met an awful lot of them. We said, well, it's dead simple. All you got to do is just change the run, run the engines on 100% hydrogen. That's 80, 90 percent of your target done. So at the same point, they went, well, can we get rid of our diesel generators, have the hydrogen storage and have the uh, basically two engines, one that's doing the primary power to the hospital, one that's the standby set. So uh, effectively, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another one that's going to be a yes no. Does does hydrogen accelerate valve wear? Does it accelerate what? Valve wear. Mount valve wear. Valves on the engine. Uh. Well, yeah, not really, because everything that we put onto the engine, because when we do, I mean, we change this, obviously, the cylinder liners and everything else, uh, everything that goes onto the, the engine for the hydrogen um, running is obviously hydrogen, all the metal and everything else, is all, it's all specified for running on hydrogen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, well, we've more or less exhausted the questions. That was a really uh, interesting presentation and a really interesting Q&A session. Um, uh, very timely. Actually, the last question I've had is, is someone who I think missed the start because they're asking if we um, provide a copy of the presentation. So just to remind everyone, uh, the presentation is being recorded and a copy of the recording and a copy of the slides will be available on our website uh, sometime tomorrow on, on the new section of the simplycertification.co.uk uh, website. So thanks again, Martin, uh, for providing that. That was very informative and it's very much a watch this space situation, I think. Yeah, no problem at all. Thank you very much.
And uh, we'll look forward to seeing some of you at the next one next month. And I'll say goodbye for now and close the session. <laughs>